Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a terrific guest on a great subject, and we have all kinds of things to talk about. Now, I'm absolutely delighted to host this week's guest for two reasons. One is that we've been looking at gaming and education for years in the Future Trends Forum. We have we have front-loaded all kinds of game platforms, game designers, game schools of thought. We've explored deeply the many ways that gaming can enhance education. So we have now, this is the other reason, a person whom I think of as an exemplar of this field. Um, Michael Townsend has created one of my favorite narrative games called A Dark Room, but he also just this month published with Google a how-to game, well, a how-to game, but an educational game that explains how the hardware of quantum computing works. And you can play it easily. If you look in the bottom left of your screen, you'll see a little box that says the Qubit game. Press that and you can dive right in. So what I'd like to do with uh, Michael Townsend is to have him talk about all the different ways he designs these games, what he has in mind, and I'd like him to be able to answer your questions. So hello, Michael. Greetings. Hey, how's it going? All right. How's Toronto? Hey, it's actually kind of nice today. It's lovely. I did a lovely little walk down to my local cafe and got a good coffee, so I'm in good spirits. Nice. Nice. Very nice. Well, welcome to the forum, and thank you for, uh, for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. We have a, a tradition where we ask guests to introduce themselves in a particular way, not what you've been working on, but what you're looking forward to working on for the next year. So what are the big projects or the big ideas that are top of mind for you? Damn, I have no idea. Like, I, I just I just finished a thing, and so I'm in sort of that mm. artist consumption absorption mode where I'm mm -hmm. just doing whatever and, and seeing what ideas pop up. I've got a couple of sort of concepts on the go, but I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to be doing for the next little while. I mean, the summer is going to be crazy like it is, but, you know, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. <laughs> That's an honest answer, and I appreciate it. Um... But that absorption is a key part. And it sounds like a key part of your process. Um, Absolutely, yeah. You can't create without spending a good amount of time just absorbing everything around you. You have to do it. Otherwise, you don't have any raw materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, I've got a couple of quick questions to put to Michael. Um, and he's going to grapple with them as best he can. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to share all the different questions you have. So today, um, as he starts answering my interrogation, uh, please start thinking about the questions you'd like to put to him. Um, and to, and if he can't answer them, he won't. And if he can, he'll go after them. Um, so the, the, the first question I'd like to ask is one that I, I, I asked you or my students asked you, I think. Um, looking at the Qubit game, can you tell us a little bit about your thinking that went into it? You, you're trying to translate a very, very complicated set of information how quantum computers work and you're trying to translate that into a game what was your mental process for doing that or what was your design process for doing that so first i got to say that i don't speak for google at all i just have to I have to say that right away i don't speak yes. for google at all this is all me um and then i can answer the question so when i approach anything um the first thing that i do is again absorption and then break the problem down once i feel like i understand it break the problem down into a few pieces. So with the Qubit game, I looked at the actual structure for the hardware layers of a quantum computer. So how these things work on a broad level, on a very general level, and I broke it down into what I saw as sort of its main component parts. And then I tackled each of those main component parts from a game mechanics perspective. How can I sort of represent this idea, this one piece of quantum computing in a, in a gaming metaphor that, that translates well? And to sort of keep doing that until it's done. Hmm. Hmm. So in, in individual sections of the idea uh, are the are the knowledge that you're trying to share that map yeah. those onto individual loops or mini games or sections within the game. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So like diving a little bit down into more, um, when when making a game, well we're in designing a game mechanic to try and explain an underlying metaphor and, and you're always doing that, right? Like whether you're oh. The underlying metaphor is a game of tennis, like in Pong, or a quantum computer, okay. like a game. When you're looking at um, mechanics that you can use as metaphors for those things, um, I try to start from sort of reality. So in the, the concept of quantum computing, the three broad layers that I broke it down into were sort of the quantum layer, 
which is the base layer of quantum computing. It's the fancy weird qubits that are doing their quantum magic, and that's sort of the smallest, most basic component of the quantum computer. But it's only a very small piece of the quantum computer. On top of that, they've got the analog layer, which is necessary to communicate with your qubits from the outside world. And then on top of that, you've got a digital layer that controls the analog layer and makes it accessible like a normal computer would be. And so I, I broke it into those three pieces and then found mechanics that sort of represented the major challenges that engineers face in each of those layers and, and tried to sort of gamify them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's fascinating. And of course, there's a, a fun recursive idea. Friends, if you if you haven't played the game yet, I, I don't want to spoil your fun because I, I think it's delightful. But I, I love the idea. And it's not it's not unique to this game. But still, it's always cool when you when you're using a computer to play a game to use a computer. You know, there's a there's a, there's a I love that recursion to it. I, just, I love interface games. Interface games are, are some of my favorite. Is there is there any interface game that you haven't made that you're especially fond of that you'd recommend? Ooh, oh damn! I mean, there are a ton. Um, there, there are a, a few in the sort of same genre as a dark room that I'm a big fan of. Um, uh, one of them would be Space Plan. I think is is really really great. Um, there's a game called TS. What is it? TS five hundred. TS. I don't know. Uh, TS. Oh, what the hell game is it called? Uh, I'll, I'll find it later. It's it's another interface game that's really really great. Um, actually, Zactronics. There's so many. Zactronics makes a lot of really of really like cool interface games. The TS100, TIS100 is is oh. one of the most extreme examples of that kind of meta self referential that you that you're talking about. Oh, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, reminds me of uh, there was a space game where you actually had the uh, command line interface was in the game to command robots as they moved around. Um, oh yeah, yeah, I know that one. Um, and like the view is like a grainy surveillance uh -huh. camera or something, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. My my son, who's never used a CLI, uh, was into it, and so I was telling him now next step Fortran. But um, <laughs> uh, so th let me let me ask a, a, a follow up question before I date myself even worse. Um, so that gives us a sense of your of your mental process and you know, where metaphor is key and and then linking up you know breaking the main the big task into smaller bits and then anal you know, connecting that to game loops. I guess the second one to ask is you know you are doing this. I know you're not speaking for Google, but you do this as a contractor working for Google. Um, what was that relationship like? I mean, how did they? What did they provide you with? I mean, what constraints did they impose on you? What was that like? Uh, well, we all sort of came into it not really knowing how the relationship was going to work. They were they were building an experiment, and I'd never done work like that for a company before. And so we kind of figured it out as we went. Um, but the relationship was very, very casual and very, very flexible. It was it was really great. I had a lot of flexibility to design and build. Um, building is a big part of my creative process when, when it comes to design. So I kind of just sort of made the game um, and and engaged in constant communication and feedback with with them and with the quantum team there to make sure that I was staying on track and that everything was good. And we did a lot of play testing that they helped me with. Yeah. I had designers on staff there that did, did a lot of the graphical work. Um, it was it was great. It felt a lot like building my own game supported by a team. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, I'm very lucky. And and just just to be clear, when you say that you for uh, you for you, a key part of design is building my sense is you mean building right away and fast to get things rolling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, especially with games, that's really important because the interaction is 90% of what you're building. And you can have a lot of ideas in your brain about how the interaction is going to feel and like what's going to work and what's not going to work, but you're not actually going to know until you have it in front of you and you're playing it. And so you need to get to that place as fast as you can because the time that you spend before you get there is very likely going to be wasted time. Uh, this is interesting. Um, you know, in, in higher education, uh, there's often this partnership between a faculty member and an instructional designer where they collaborate on, on doing certain digital projects for, uh, for a class. Uh, I think you just outlined one really interesting way for them to collaborate. Uh, we have a quick question that came up from uh, our wonderful friend Stephen Ehrman, which I should have asked myself, um, but I was too excited. He asks, what is an interface game? Can you define that? Please? Oh, um, I mean, that's I don't know that that's a term that anybody uses other than me. Um, but an interface game, as I designed, as I define it, is a game where the game literally is an interface. So like a lot of video games, you know, you're seeing it from a camera that's over the shoulder of a guy carrying a big gun or something, right? Like 
or whatever, but interface games, the game itself is like an interface to a, an application that doesn't look like a game per se. It looks like a web app. And I just love those things because it's, it's, it boils games down really to their root component, which is here's a box, play with it, figure out how it works. How can you change it? How can you master it? Interface games are just little puzzles. I just love playing with them. Excellent. Uh, Steven, thank you for asking. And Michael, if, if you've invented the term, we, I think we've now coined it. Uh, yeah. because <laughs> it, it works for me. Friends, if you're, if you're new to the forum, you can see that we are very happy with all of your questions. So as we proceed, if we jump over a term too quickly, please throw out a question. We're happy to handle it. Um, and uh, and it, even as I say that, more questions have come in. Here's one from John Hollenbeck, who asks a deep question. Uh, what makes a game educational? I sense as a builder, you can constrain choices, which directs learning like a lecture. Yeah. Um, so. I think that all games are educational, first of all, and, and I can explain why for it. Mm -hmm. pretty pretty quickly is that play itself is educational right like the earliest examples of games the early ex examples of play those things exist to teach concepts and you look at the animal kingdom they play to learn you look at children they're playing to learn play is fundamentally educational and games are the aesthetic expression of play just as you know movies are the exp the aesthetic expression of um i don't know drama like human interaction and and Paintings are the aesthetic expression of pictures. Um, games are the aesthetic expression of play. And so by nature, they are educational. They're teaching you something. Um, it's just that we as game designers, especially designing for entertainment, don't usually think about what the game is teaching. In most games, all they're teaching you is how to play the game. And that's not useful, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is. There, there's um, transferable skills and a lot of things that are, that are broad that you can learn. But like, what differentiates an educational game from an entertainment game would be that you intentionally use the mechanics of the game to teach something that, that you want to teach. So you're thinking more about what the game is actually teaching the player. There are lots of ways to do it. Um, I don't think most people do it well. Then what, um, what role does the, uh, uh, in the chat, John said, he follows up by saying no different from how to get a degree, which is another game. Um, but I, I'm curious about one part of John's question, which was about constraints, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and he compared them really interestingly to uh, to a lecture. You know, a lecture is limited by time and, and by other things. Uh, how, what role do constraints play in designing educational games? Hmm. Um, I mean, when it comes to design, I find constraints are more around the technology that you're using, um, the time that you have to build. Um, Constraints, like I didn't really have a lot of constraints from Google in so far, uh, other, than, other than that they wanted something very similar to a dark room. That was really my constraint there. Like we wanted an experience like this, which I probably would have done anyway, because I think that that kind of format is very good for education. Um, when, when I'm thinking about how to use a game to teach, the constraints around education, I think, are, are more around sort of cognitive limits of people that are engaging with it. So if you if you drop, you know, a grab bag of 50 different game mechanics on somebody right away, they're going to get overloaded. Yeah. Um, and so with games, you can pace the, the delivery and um, you can actively integrate the sort of lecture with the test, right? Um, the lecture will be repeated until you pass the test. And it doesn't feel like that um, because you're playing a game, but it's true. And so a really, really good example is from the very first level of the very first Mario game. Mm -hmm. A really, really good example of sort of integrating a lesson with a lecture or with a test. Very beginning, Mario's there, you, run, you learn that you need to run forward. So you've right. learned that you can't proceed until you've learned that then right. immediately you're faced with a little Goomba and you have to learn that you can jump over him. And if you don't learn that, you die. And you keep dying until you learn that. And they won't give you anything harder until you get past that. And that's really, really core to game design in general is that you need to introduce your challenges one at a time and repeat those challenges until the player can pass them. And then you can build on that and make it more complex and more difficult and exactly the same thing for education. Uh, my students were keen on identifying that as scaffolding, which is a, a term of art in, mm. in pedagogy. Um, you know, you think uh, 
you, you think, for example, of a foreign language where you only introduce so many new vocabulary words at a time, because if you give some of the dictionary, they, they drown. Um, yep. And then you give them one verb and they have to keep working at it un until uh, they get to work. Um, so that, and that's just that's just how games work, right? Like, yeah, levels get harder, right? <laughs> and, and as game designers, like we've known that for ever since we started designing games. But it, it's exactly the same as education because games are education. Mm -hmm. uh, in in the chat, Rebecca Frazzi adds another classic uh, term uh, from uh, a century ago, actually, but a really really powerful one called the zone of proximal development, um, which uh, a Russian uh, theoretician came up with. That's just that there's that zone where you know where you're the game gets a little tougher, and so you've got to be a bit more challenged. But it's not going to destroy your your life immediately. It's going to mm -hmm. you know be enough for you to go. And it can't be too boring. It can't be too easy. You, you know, can't just keep jumping the Goomba over and over again. You have to add yeah. two of them or make it exactly. yeah, In game design, we would call that the challenge curve. Yes. Uh, James Paul G has a terrific book about this uh, where he really, really brings these together. And he agrees with you in the idea that every game teaches you something. Mm -hmm. uh, it might not be a great thing uh, or it might just be how to play the game, but they do have to teach. Uh, John wants to join us up on stage. So let me bring him up. Let me make some room. Hello, John. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, John. Hey, Michael. Yeah. My son's in Toronto at York. He's just graduated up there, and he's going to try to figure out how to live. So <laughs> That's not here. <laughs> That's what I tell him. But yeah, this, this conversation, I go back a long ways in education, but I, I just want to bring up something from the hoary past, and that's Seymour Papert's Mindstorms. I don't know if you're aware of that book. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yes, now, we grab this. Yeah, see, this is this goes back to what I was doing back then. But essentially, the argument is that Papert makes is: Do we want the computer to program the student, or the student to program the computer? <laughs> and I still say that that Mindstorms is the only book of creative use of computing as an educational device. And I guess what I'm trying to get at in my questions is that. When you design an environment like a game, you're in charge of right and wrong, and to a, to a, to a degree. But like, if you give somebody a trombone, there's a lot of possibilities that they could they could take this. It's a it's a different experience than a, a closed form game. And so, yeah, I guess I, agree. I mean, you define the success criteria. Okay, hmm. but some games don't even have success criteria, right? Like, look at Minecraft. Right. You just play yeah. that. You play it to play it. There's no right or wrong way of doing it at all. Yeah, and I think that's another. And that's another in the Paparian way. You know, and actually, Lego Lego Mindstorms. Was... That's and that's. I was wondering why the, the word Mindstorms mm -hmm. sounded familiar, and it's because yeah. of Lego Mindstorms. And I wonder if there's a connection there. Yep. We need we need, we need a course in, in in all of this. And what? <laughs> yeah, because it's easy. You know, it, it's easy to shuffle by all of this stuff. But uh, you know, there are some there are some phenomenal writing in the '70s, '80s, and '90s about what computers should be based on what people were seeing then. And it's not to say that we old farts had all the ideas, but it was just a different perspective available mm -hmm. then. But anyway, I mean, that's just the, the one comment. It's, it's like, my son is a gamer to the, to the detriment of everything. And I don't mind it so much because he's gaining some kind of skill, but at the same time, he's not gaining agency in that he is not in charge of making a world, which he now has to do as a college graduate. Mm, but you know, like that, that sounds a hell of a lot like my path. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, like I said, you can't, you can't create without consumption and by consuming media and consuming culture and consuming ideas, you, the, the, the creative seeds appear and whether or not you decide you're going to follow them and actually make stuff and do things is, is up to you. But games can help with that too, because games absolutely help develop a sense of agency. Yeah, especially. Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, this have agency. I just wanted to pick your brain on something. I feel better about my son's path right now. Then. <laughs> well, you should. And, and John, congratulations. That's great to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. He's yeah. He's in danger of a double major in writing. So I wish him all nice. the best in life. Yes. Indeed. Indeed. Um, and if you haven't, uh, I put a link to uh, uh, an early PDF of Papert's book. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a terrific book. Uh, I've been trying to excerpt it from one of my classes. Um, I, I really recommend it. It's also uh, 
he's also the mind behind the logo language, uh, which is a way oh, of teaching cool. kids how to how to program. Yeah. Um, well, that's a that's a video question, by the way. So if any of you uh, want to join us, and uh, you can tell that uh, Michael and I are, are both very kind to you, um, please uh, cl click the raised hand. And uh, we have more questions coming in. We have the excellent Roxanne Riskin. And Roxanne asks, what are your thoughts, and have you seen more attention to game design on accessibility, meaning for students who have cognitive, physical, mental challenges? Yeah. Um, so the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, the, this is actually a really, really big topic in game design circles right now. If you were to jump onto you know, game design Twitter, it's, it's a really, really big concept. And it's a really big specifically because of a recent game that's been released called Elden Ring. Mm. Um, mm. And I, I could talk forever just about that. But the, this game, for whatever reasons, uh, for, for various reasons, has really brought up this debate about accessibility in gaming. And, and where, how much responsibility game designers have for accessibility and like whether or not accessibility impacts a creative vision and all of these things is, is a very much in the game design sphere of consciousness right now. Um, my thoughts, my opinion on it is that accessibility can never ever hurt a product. Um, and as an artist, as a game designer, you want as many people to be able to enjoy and play your game as possible. And accessibility is absolutely a part of that. Um, I am ashamed to admit that the games that I make are not accessible because I'm one dude. Um, I would love, I, 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 I intend to do better at that um, because I should do better at that. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's really big right now. Very, very big. There are lots of things that you can do in game design to, um, to aid with accessibility, but I'm absolutely not the right person to talk to that, to speak to that. There's, there's a really great, um, a really great guy, Grant Stoner, I believe his name is, who is himself a disabled gamer, and he speaks very, very, very well and eloquently on this stuff. Mm. Uh, and I would strongly recommend that you follow him, Michael. If you, if you can, is it Grant Stoner? Yep, Grant Stoner. Okay, thank you. Um... That's really helpful. Um, oh yeah, he, on the Twitter, you super crypt nineteen ninety four. Very good, very good. Um, as always, Roxanne, it's a great question. By the way, Roxanne Riskin has just as almost preternatural gift for doing screen grabs that make everybody look great. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I just gave up. I just let her do it. She's just remarkable. That, but she's thank you. That's a great question. Um, and Michael, thank you for that very candid answer. Um, this is uh, this is definitely a huge topic, and I think we'll be doing more and more of this. Um, we have more questions coming in all over the map, so let me bring these up. This is from Lee Nichols, and Lee comes back to one of John's points. Uh, games are interactive and great agency of the player. Some educational models do not. Do you think that's a major factor in the attractiveness of using games in education, or are there bigger factors? Yeah. Um, short answer, yes. <laughs> longer, <laughs> longer answer is that going back to an earlier point that I made in that play is sort of the fundamental building block of education, I would say that the fact that most educational models don't include sort of an interactive component is to their great detriment. Because the interactivity is what builds curiosity and builds confidence and builds all of these connections hmm. that strongly, strongly aid in learning. Like I, I don't remember where I read this, but I strongly believe it to be true that, that the single most important thing when it comes to whether or not you're going to learn something is curiosity. Mm. And games interactivity build that like nothing else. Like a textbook can't do that. You already have to be interested. I'm thinking about your example of Mario uh, where, well, you have to go someplace and you, it's not working. Well, why not? You want to solve that. Yep. Um, yes, absolutely. There's a, a wonderful, uh, more recent game, um, uh, uh, kind of post-nuclear game, uh, Fallout 3, and uh, it, it begins with the main character as a baby, um, and the tutorial is your first 16 years of life, yeah. um, and so you know, it all you so it puts you in those shoes, like how do I get out of this crib, or who is this person, and it, it drives you through very, very nicely. That 
is a really, really good example of something called ludo narrative cohesion. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so uh, narrative, I'm sure that that word is familiar to people, but ludic ludo is sort of the, the the fancy word that we use in game design to represent the interactive component of a, a game. And ludo narrative cohesion or dissonance is how well your mechanics, your interactive component dovetail with your narrative component to, to strengthen your point. And, and that's like, that's where games really, really shine when your mechanics and whatever metaphor, like whatever you're trying to get across your point, your narrative, your whatever, when those things dive, when they resonate, your game is good. And so when you look at the beginning of Fallout 3, in a tutorial situation, you have to limit player agency so that you're keeping that cognitive window small, right? Like you have to drip feed stuff. But why would the character in a narrative sense be limited? Well, he's a kid. Kids have limited agency. It's perfect, right? Like that's a very, very good example. Um, it's and it's a great game as a whole, which I recommend. Um, but it's but yeah, I think that's a great great tutorial. Um, there, uh, people have been throwing in a bunch of questions now, and I need to I need to get out, stop asking my own because these guys are good. <laughs> um, we have uh, uh, Nathan Kelber from Ithaca. Hello, Nathan, uh, who asks, I completed a PhD focused on games and play. Recently, I became a programming teacher. Your games have inspired me to try to create games for fun. How would you get awesome. started? Uh, just do it. Um, <laughs> so consume, play lots of games until you feel inspired and then build it. The trick there, the real strong, difficult trick is limiting your scope. Um, as a first time game designer or developer, you're, mm -hmm. you're going to want to build something huge. Your, your inspiration is going to be huge. It's going to be far too big. Try and make it really small. Um, my game, A Dark Room, is a good example. I was able to build that in two weeks, which is small enough for one person to do before burning out and feeling tired. Um, and you can get bigger after you're comfortable and after you've got your sea legs and stuff. But like, think of something small. Build it. If it's really your first game, copy somebody else. Find a game that you like that's small, that seems easy. Make your own version. Mm -hmm. What the, if, if I can't, Nathan, if, if my question is, off base, please let me know in the chat. Uh, I'm just curious for people who don't have coding. I'm just curious. Um, what platform or tool would you recommend them use? Say RPG Maker, Game Maker Two. Mm. Uh, so that, like, would, that would depend very, very strongly on on your project, right? Um, there are lots of different game engines and lots of different tools out there. Some like RPG Maker are specifically focused on building a very specific style of game. Others like say Unity are large engines that can do complicated 3D games, you know, at AAA stuff built in Unity. Um, so depending on what you need to do, you pick your engine. Um, I just want to drop a little bit of a, a sort of self-promotion. My stuff, at least everything that isn't really new, is all open source. The source code is available on GitHub. You want to, like, go look at how a darkroom is built, maybe copy it, change it, that's a really good way to get started. That's fantastic. Um, thank you. I didn't know that they were open source. That's yep. terrific. Yep. You can double speak uh, is on GitHub. Um, and yeah, like, so like I learned to build stuff and learn to work on the web by tearing apart other people's stuff, right? Like, yep. and so if I didn't have all of that stuff that I could tear apart to learn, I wouldn't be where I am. And so, it's my responsibility to make sure that the next generation has stuff to tear apart. Well, that's really forward looking as a futurist. I approve. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, in the chat. There's one more recommendation, which is to make tabletop board games um, as well. And I, I second that. Uh, yep. Pen and, or pen and paper and cardboard is a really good way of prototyping. Even if you intend to build a digital game in the long run, prototyping on paper is a way to get to your interactive state faster. Right, mm -hmm. you build it in cardboard. You can play it with your friends and see how it works before you even start to code. Very, very smart. Um, so I think everybody here is like cracking their knuckles now and getting ready to start uh, setting things up. But we have uh, questions. We have one from uh, our dear friend Tom Hames, uh, who asks, "Can you compare the curiosity learning effects of open-ended games like Dungeons and Dragons 
versus closed games with a fixed end? Well, I think that open-ended stuff like D&D uh, teaches very different things, right? Like Dungeons & Dragons, from a game design perspective, is an extremely open game, right? Like the, the system, the set of rules requires a human involved to improvise and make decisions. So not all the rules of the system are codified in the rules of the system, yeah? Um, games like that, those, those are teaching you very different things. Like D&D builds social skills more than anything. Like, yeah, it builds math because you've got to roll dice and do a lot of math, but mostly it builds social skills. Your, um, it, like, social and um, empathetic skills, right? Yeah, like, you're learning to put yourself in a different person's place. You're learning to look at, at emotions and perspectives from maybe different angles. You're learning to improvise and deal with things on, on a, you know, that, that you may not have predicted. Problem-solving skills, all of those things are developed by games like Dungeons and Dragons. Whereas a closed game like say the Cubit game is a significantly more linear where we have designed, you know, the path that we want you to take, the things that we want you to learn and when, we can tailor that very specifically to target very specific skills that you probably couldn't teach in D&D. That's an interesting way of putting it. Um, you could think of some professional games for the workplace, you know, designed mm -hmm. to teach you how to repair a drill or something that'd be that narrow. Yep. And, and with the rise of VR and AR, I believe oh. that all education will be gaming at some point in the future. Who knows when? But, like, I just I hate the term game. I really do. Because, like, it says as soon as we add interactivity to anything, we call it a game. And that's dumb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I, I hope you're right. Um, the, there's the claim the 21st century will be the ludic century. Uh, which I have hopes for. Um, yep. I mean, and you can already see it starting, right? Like gamification as a, a buzzword got pretty popular like 10, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember. What is time now? I'm not sure how many years ago things are, but I think it was around 10 years ago yeah. where, where everybody started to realize that you could very strongly shape human behavior by adding a point system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's been used for good and evil, but like that, that, that's the beginning of this sort of ludic, um, immersion, this like bl blurring of the line between games and reality. Uh, Abby Johnson in the chat points out that there are other negative senses of game, the word game, like gaming the system. Uh, and in my work for the past 25 years, when I introduce games to academics, they often think game means something just for children or yeah. uh, a game is a psychological manipulation. So it's, uh, there, there is that. <laughs> yeah, then they often mean the the, the, is, a psych is a psychological manipulation. <laughs> so is, yeah, so is speech. Uh, uh, Tom, thank you for that fantastic question. Tom has a real gift for asking very deep questions. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, Sarah Stolberg Berkowitz, Sarah, I hope I didn't get this wrong. Uh, Professor Berkowitz asks this question I'm interested in using games in student assessment, not just learning. Mm. Do you have any advice? I mean, assessment is, is really tricky, right? Like, um, and like I have, a, I have a lot of opinions on grading, but it's it's a it's a necessity and a truth of our, our academic system and our education system. I think that it would be very difficult um, to design a game that works as both an education game and an assessment game that would actually give you like a, a grade point or something like this. The student mm -hmm. deserves a seventy percent on this test or something. Mm -hmm. That would be tricky. Um, I, I don't know how to do that. That would be a very interesting problem. Um, if you want to work on it, hit me up. Sarah, um, what a great question. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see what can come from this. Um, uh, just in, in full disclosure, I'm starting my gaming and education seminar again in a couple of weeks. So Sarah, I may put that before my students to see what they think of as well. Uh, good question. Good question. Uh, and uh, Lee, uh, Lee Nichols has a follow-up question, which is really, really good. How does a game designer think about player failure? Mm. Do you see that as similar or different from how education handles failure? Well, um, game designers think about player failure a lot because players will fail. Like if you're, you're not all, well, not all games have failure states, um, but if they do have failure states, and most games have failure states, that's got to be a really big part of your design. Um, 
I, I, another thing that I have strong opinions on, I think that player failure is almost a necessary evil in a lot of situations, right? Like, because without stakes, a game loses a lot of its teeth. But player failure is inherently frustrating, right? Like, failure sucks. It's not a fun feeling. Yeah. And so as a, as a game designer, you either have to really limit player failure or make it fun. And there are lots of ways to do that. Um, and different games have different approaches. There are games like the From Software games, like Dark Souls, Elden Ring. Those games, their take on player failure is, sucks to be you, you deserve it. And it, it, it hurts, and it's intended to hurt, right? Like, they've designed it so that player failure is bad. Like, you really don't want to fail. Yeah. And that generates stress and tension, and they use that well. Um, other games... Uh, let's use an example like uh, Super Meat Boy. Super Meat Boy is uh, like 2D, fast-paced, platformy. Oh game. yeah, yeah. And it's it's really, really, really hard. And you're going to be trying to beat a particular you know part of a level thousands of times. Really, really hard. But what they do is they shorten the um, feedback loop. So the time between when you fail and when you start again is almost zero there's no reset time right as soon as you die you're right back at the beginning of the thing that you died at right back immediately the music is going you're ready to go there's no time to be frustrated. Just try again try again try again try again and without that beat of oh i've got to do this again you don't even have a chance it's just ah oh, i'm gonna do it and after you finally succeed it shows you a little video of all of your attempts played on top of each other and you see like thousands of these little meat boys diving into saws and spikes and like oh, wow. it is so cool and so that way they've turned that frustrating thing of player failure into just something that's kind of fun and hilarious wow so i i've, I've only played a little bit i haven't i haven't gotten that far but yeah. and then there are games that just don't do failure like uh you can't really fail at the cubic game you can't really fail at a dark room my, my games don't tend to have failure you can't yeah. Win. yeah, it's uh, it's it's always positive. You're always accomplishing something. Yeah. Um, the, the the failure state is just now you're accomplishing things slower. Oh, well, that's a that's a good point. Or in some games, the if if you are actually the villain, then the failure state might be good for humanity. Um, you know, um, the uh, there's one game where you where you play an oil company trying to ruin the world. Um, it's from Moly Industries, and uh, so if you fail, you know that's a good good for everyone. But but here we have uh, we have a, a guest who uh, I, I want to be up on stage because he's a, a person from a wonderful company. Uh, this is Jeff Fisk from uh, Muzzy Lane Software, and he has all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of thoughts. Hello, Jeff. Well, Michael, uh, you're uh, you, I've got the gray hair. You you don't. Back in the '90s, I was making games and. Uh, did commercial games for about 15 years and then awesome. I know. serious games and now Muzzy Lane uh we are trying to to do what you know the impossible right turn education turn games in education and our take uh you know so, so much of what the reality is and some of the things you touched on is who is your consumer Yep. How is it actually going to get consumed? Mm -hmm. So like when you say AR, VR is coming, we all know it is, but how many of us actually own the goggles or the PC to, to move it forward, right? Mm -hmm. So our stuff's browser-based. Um, it actually, as you make it, it's accessible. But our take is role-playing. Let's put the student in it and have them practice. So we work heavily with McGraw. Their take was teach something, some teach someone something like for a piece of marketing, then have them run a scenario where they run the food truck, and they actually apply it. And what's mm -hmm. what's fun about it is that they experience the same cognitive in their brain. You're just doing the same thing. I was trained as a professional pilot. You're in, you're in the simulator. Uh, yeah. You know, it's an analog. Right. So our challenge and when our design approach is how can we make an analog for training? Right. And you can argue it's more simulation than game. I um, I we do kind of lament that we do, can't really use the same types of key challenges in game mechanics because uh, students would actually get really angry if they failed frequently 
when they're doing a homework assignment, mm -hmm. right? So love the, uh, I agree with everything you, you've been saying and you're more up to date on what's been happening. Um, you know, I could give my real world references, go back a long time. Um, but yeah, it, it is, it's, it's an exciting field, obviously. Um, Brian's trying to bring us all together to, to, to um, try and crack this nut. Um, I will mention that um, SUNY Buffalo, for example, has an instructional design program in gaming and they use our tool. They used to use Unity, too complex. Yeah. So when you're trying, like you said, you want to start with that quick analog. Mm -hmm. let's, so, so our platform, there's no scripting, just boom, you go in there, what you see is what you get. You can launch it, play for free. We don't charge until you start making money. So, um, that's an incredible uh, platform you've got. Um, I, I don't, but please, Michael, uh, have at it. What do you what do you think of this of the, of of everything that uh, Jeff has just been saying? No, he's he's absolutely right. Right, like the the way if you want to teach a particular sort of skill or um, what's the word I want to looking for, you're trying to teach a particular kind of chunk of stuff like a, a food truck or whatever right you, if you can put the player into a context where they're doing that thing even if it's even if it's not actually that thing if it's if it's like a simplification of that thing or like a metaphor of that thing that's transferable right like it's transferable because they if you could it's an emotional state you're trying to put them in you put them in an emotional state that is similar to the emotional state that they'll be in when they're actually doing the real thing and if they're in that same state you're going to be developing confidence you're going to be developing connections you're going to be developing all of this stuff and that is exactly how i built the cuba game mm -hmm. yeah that that meditative deep state so the first game I ever made was a civil war game it was analog for a paper and pencil Huh. When I blew up the paper and pencil rules, so the restrictions to turn take advantage of the computer. But yeah, you 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 think about it and you ingest it and you you regurgitate it out into a different form to so that as a user is playing it, they they don't realize that things have happened in their subconscious. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like you were describing your your favorite tutorial, the Fallout 3. Well, similarly, if you really want a crash course in game design. Portal has got a great breakdown oh, in yeah. there. They actually have a design breakdown afterwards. If you have the gold edition, you probably can find it online where they actually show you how they designed it. And um, the entire game, actually, um, the, the, the first few levels are actually all the tutorial. And that, that used to be like all part of one scenario. And as Michael was saying, the, uh, the cognitive overload is real. You can only have the person either consume the game or consume the UI. You can't have them do the same thing at the same time. Mm. So you have, and, and in Portal, they describe that process. And sure enough, you pat yourself on the back for figuring these complex puzzles out. But in fact, the designers show you how they introduced you and taught you how to do those things a level earlier. They just didn't call it that. So it's exactly. very, so very interesting. Yeah. And like, when you do it like that, you can teach people things and they don't even know it, right? Like it's inception and that's what makes it so effective. If people would come off testing the Cubic game and go, it was fun, but I don't think I learned anything about quantum computing. And then I'd be like, oh, really? Well, then tell me like, what's a quantum computer built of? And they're like, oh, it's this, this. did you know that before? And they go, no, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> And I was I just about to say that, that right there is the promise of game-based learning, right? Is that you can teach people things even though they don't realize it. There was uh, there was one book on this which was titled uh, "Don't Bother Me, Mom, I'm Learning," right? uh, which I love. Yeah, and um, as soon as you, as soon as someone thinks that you're trying to teach them something, they shut off. Yeah, unfortunately, that's that's uh, the, the, that's legacy of schooling. Jeff, uh, thank you. And if if Jeff, if you can, just just throw a link to uh, Muzzy Lane in the chat, so ever the few people who don't know of you all can uh, can click there and, and learn more. So I, I also just dropped a link in the chat to Extra Credits Design Club, um, oh. and don't don't be thrown off by like the silly animation and the like chipmunk style voice stuff. These guys oh. know oh. their shit, and mm -hmm. they cover some really really great topics. Um, that the entire series is good. 
But Design Club is particularly interesting. They, they deep dive on design choices in popular games and why they've done things the way that they've done. It's really, really informative. Oh, terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, see, what we're hoping to do is we hope that this hour of conversation has been stimulating enough that people don't run away and start playing games. Uh, it's kind of perverse, right? I, I have to, mm -hmm. uh, if we succeed in a, or if we fail, everyone's happier. Um, uh, we have a great question from Sarah San Gregorio, uh, who is going to have to be hired by numerous universities really soon because she is amazing. Uh, and Sarah asks, are the mechanics that you utilize for people who are completionists along the lines of accomplishments? Hmm. So I'm not exactly sure what that what that question is getting at, but it it does make me think a little bit about the aesthetics of play. Um, this is something that game design academia sort of has has broken games down into. I think it's like seven main aesthetics of play, yeah. um, and one of one of them is like completion. Yeah. There are definitely some players who are motivated by completion, by ticking off boxes, by like finishing everything. Um, and if you if you want to design a game that's going to have mass appeal, you're going to try and include mechanics that sort of hit on all of the different aesthetics of play so that there's something for everybody. Typically, a game will focus on one or two main aesthetics that are their primary aesthetics, but it's definitely useful for all games to include some aesthetics of for everybody and achievements, accomplishments are are an excellent example, right? Like even games that don't actually have completionism in their core mechanical loops, most of them have an achievement system on Xbox Live or on Steam or whatever, mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. do certain things in a certain way, you get a little achievement. And the completionists can hunt all of those achievements. It makes your game more compelling and more engaging. And Sarah just confessed, she just outed herself as a completionist. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and Jeff added uh, some uh, some good Muzzy Lane uh, info, including how to find him. Um, for completionists, if if you're looking for this, by the way, I just uh, found a new little game. I mean, like ten minutes to play tops. It's uh, from the the Financial Times, and it's a game which puts you in charge of the world for the next uh, fifty years as you try to solve climate change. Um, and it, it, yeah, I'll just put a link to it here. It, it's an interesting one to think about, in part because it has a completionist mechanism of, as you were just saying, uh, Michael, um, awards. Um, and you get a little trophy case, which they bring up every so often. Yep. And that just that's just there to drive engagement, right? Like, there's no mechanical purpose for that to be there, but it's it's there because people like it. It it gives you dopamine. It hooks you into the system. It keeps you engaged. But it doesn't have the ludo narrative coherence you're talking about before. Right. There's right. Like most of these achievement systems are very um, fourth wall -y, right? Like they're outside mm -hmm. of the game. Um, yeah. The diet diegetic? No, non diegetic. Non diegetic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That, and everyone gets that. that that's a tricky one. Um, well, I, I, we're coming close to the end of our hour, um, which is uh, ridiculous. But uh, I have one question before anybody else gets a chance to put one in, uh, which is to ask you. Uh, where where do you see educational gaming design uh, headed over, like say the the next five years? Are are we going to move completely into uh, virtual reality? Do you see more narrative or crafting games? Do you think there's a big bubble of gaming about to burst, or where do you see this all headed? Well, I think so. I mean, there's there's a lot to cover there. Um, I think VR is about is is a dead end. Um, I think AR is going to change the world. Ah. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, yeah. I think that just by nature of progress and sort of the marketplace of ideas, I think that games and education are definitely going to continue to grow because they are so effective, right? Like an educational system that includes interactive components will always outperform one that doesn't. And so, yeah, I think that, that mm -hmm. gaming and education is going to continue to grow. I think that gaming as a part of our life is just going to continue to grow. And we may eventually, we may, we may have to abandon that term game pretty soon because I, I do think that it's going to completely infuse into all parts of our life. Just because life is more fun with games. So it's one of those ways in which something becomes uh, ubiquitous that we stop referring yeah. to it. Uh, we stop naming it as something. Yeah. Um, and that's, that, that's a fascinating idea. Um, I, I love, uh, Jen Obando, uh, 
her ears perked up and so did Sarah's. They said, wait, what, what about AR and VR? Why is VR a dead end? And why would AR transform the world? <laughs> so, I mean, this is, this is definitely just an opinion of mine, but I do think that VR is a niche product. I don't think that it's, it's ever going to be something that everybody has, right? Like, you're not going to see people walking around the street with VR goggles strapped to their heads because it is fundamentally isolating. VR is a fundamentally isolating experience, and humanity is a fundamentally social creature. So, like, yeah, VR is fun, and, like, I enjoy dropping into my VR headset and playing Beat Saber sometimes, and it's kind of cool, and it can be used in very targeted situations, but it's not going to become a ubiquitous part of everyday life. Whereas augmented reality absolutely will. Um, once the technology gets down to a point where it's cheap and easy, everybody will have AR instead of a cell phone. And once that install base is down, everything's going to be different, right? Like, it, things will change in ways that I can't predict. Uh, this is uh, the science fiction writer Neil Stephenson. I, I asked him what uh, the next... Uh, uh, handset or the next uh, hardware would be and he said it would be spectacles uh that that was the uh and of course not just spectacles but spectacles with audio and you can control them with with gesture and so on and stevenson uh, has been very good at predicting the future he's, he's very good one of one of the sci-fi writers that i mean a significant portion of today's current hot technology is 100 percent inspired by works of neil stevenson <laughs> right like like metaverse right met Facebook renamed to Meta because of Neil Stevenson. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, people want people blew this up, Michael, in the chat. Uh, uh, Tom Hames thinks VR is going to be something you visit, like a movie theater, like a holodeck. Uh, Abby Johnson says that VR is expensive and also gives a lot of folks motion sickness. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a problem that will be solved, right? Like motion sickness in, in VR design is absolutely something that is a big part of being a VR designer is trying to design experiences that don't trigger motion sickness and finding ways to mitigate. Um, and like cost of headsets, that'll come down. That's a technology problem. Moore's law will solve mm -hmm. that. Um, but the, the fundamentally isolating experience will never, never stop. Um, and if you do get rid of the isolating experience, it's no longer VR, it's AR. Uh, quick question for everybody uh, who has been using the chat. Uh, I would love, I've gotten requests to blog up the uh, chat record. Um, I'd love to do that. Uh, I'll anonymize you all. Just remove your names. Uh, if anyone has any objections to that, please uh, say so in the chat. Um, if you're not using the chat, well, then move on. Um, but uh, um, that's a Michael. That's a fascinating phrase that uh, VR becomes AR once it becomes social. That's a uh, that's a very very interesting idea. Um, we've had a whole bunch of other uh, comments. Uh, Abby Johnson made me happy by mentioning uh, alternate reality games and LARPing. Um, so that's a, a whole other field, which doesn't even require digital technology. Uh, Nathan Kelber makes a very, very good point. There's a history of games breaking off into art forms. Theater or music are notable examples. We continue to use the words play with each, but don't ever call them games. A very, very good point. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this is bringing us to the end of our, of our time. Um, Michael, uh, it seems like the best way to keep up with you is basically to run really fast um, behind you. But, um, but besides that, is uh, is Twitter where you where you mostly uh, update the world on your work, or should we just follow DoubleSpeak Games? Yeah, I mean, usually I don't. Um, I've I've developed a little bit of a an air of mystery as a reclusive artist, but that's just because I don't like engaging with social media. If people ask me to to come talk, I do, as you can tell. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, if you follow DoubleSpeak on any of the social platforms, I've got a presence. Um, if there are new new things that DoubleSpeak has released, I update there, but it's very, very infrequent. Um, only only when I actually do stuff. I understand. I understand. Well, uh, I'm glad that you came out of your reclusive shell in uh, far off Toronto. No, you uh, just asked me to talk. <laughs> That's all it takes. <laughs> sometimes that is. Sometimes that is. And, yeah, uh, but no, no, like all, all the socials. Follow me on socials and I'll, an, an email if you want to talk. I'm Michael at doublespeakgames.com. Um, I'm I'm always around. Very good. Well, if there's, uh, um, we'd love to uh, uh, bring you back perhaps next year when we learn about your next project, which will probably take over the planet. Uh, in the meantime, Michael, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic hour. Uh, I really appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to what all of your absorption and thinking of media now 
brings out of you next for your next game. Yeah, we'll see. I'm, I'm also interested to see what happens. I never know. <laughs> <laughs> Take care and enjoy spring as it comes to Canada. Yeah, thank you. You too. Now, don't uh, don't leave everybody. Uh, I've got to uh, let you know what we're up to over the next few weeks. Uh, I do want to thank you all for your uh, for your great questions and comments. Um, if you're if you'd like to keep talking about this, um, I'm happy to keep talking about this on Twitter. Just use at Brian Alexander or, of course, at Shindig Events or just go to my blog, BrianAlexander.org, because uh, in all those places, I get things stirred up about gaming and, of course, use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, if you'd like to dive into the past of our previous sessions on gaming, we have a whole bunch. Just go to tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive. Uh, if you'd like to keep thinking about gaming and all the other issues around the future of higher ed, remember forum.futureofeducation.us will show you what's coming up next. And if you're proud of something that you'd like to share, if it's game-related or otherwise, just let me know. Email me, and I'd be glad to share it with everybody else. You guys are wonderful, and I'm happy to celebrate you. Uh, and thank you again for thinking uh, with a really exciting topic today. Uh, I hope all of you are safe and sound and doing well. In the meantime, take care, be well, get ready for summer or winter, depending on which side of the planet you're on, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.